Welcome to episode 223 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Jacques Baptiste, who served in the FBI for 22 years. Jock was a member of the Washington Field Office, WFO, Joint Terrorism Task Force, JTTF, as the lead agent covering national security special events in the Washington metropolitan area. He also served on the WFO SWAT team. In this episode, Jock reviews the FBI's international response to the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Later in his career, Jock was assigned to the Hazardous Device Response Unit as a bomb technician team medic and the FBI Anti-Terrorism Unit. He was also assigned to the Counterterrorism Division and served as the program manager of the Africa Fusion Cell, managing strategies for dismantlement of terrorist groups in northern and western Africa. In his final FBI career position, Jock was assigned to the Director's Office of Partner Engagement, where he participated in a six-month fellowship with the International Association of Chief of Police, helping to build better bridges of information sharing and law enforcement policy design between the FBI and state, local, and international law enforcement agencies. Jock and I recorded this interview several weeks ago. Ironically, his interview and his last words provide an opportunity for us to think about the dangers of being an FBI agent and being in law enforcement. Yesterday, on February 3rd, 2021, Special Agent Laura Schwarzenberger and Special Agent Daniel Alfin were shot and killed in the line of duty while executing a federal court-ordered search warrant and a Crimes Against Children investigation in Sunrise, Florida. Three other agents were also shot and wounded. Before we start the interview, let's have a moment of silence and reflection as we dedicate this episode to Laura and Dan and their families and friends and all who serve in law enforcement and risk their lives every day to keep us safe. Laura and Dan, may you rest in peace. Thank you. Now, here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Jacques Baptiste. Hey, Jacques, how are you? Good afternoon, ma'am. How are you? I am great. I am excited about this particular episode because I have done a number of shows regarding incidents that occur overseas. And we have talked about the Bureau's extraterritorial jurisdiction. But what you've agreed to do today is for us to take one of those incidents, one of those crisis events overseas, and to really take a a detailed, drilled down look at what happened from the beginning until the end, you know, when it comes to the FBI's response to a crisis event overseas what happened at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. On August 7, 1998, there was an explosion that had occurred at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. And 10 minutes later, that explosion occurred at 10.30 a.m., where a truck bomb actually was exploded. 10 minutes later, at 10.40, a second truck bomb was detonated in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, at the U.S. Embassy there as well. Once those two incidents occurred, it sounded off an immediate alarm globally to what had occurred. FBI took an active role in it because they were both U.S. interests involved. The U.S. Embassy itself, the people who were killed in both embassies who were U.S. citizens, and also serving to assist our Kenyan national agencies, as well as other global agencies who suffered as a result of this attack. 
There were 224 people killed in Nairobi. 12 of them were Americans. And there were over 4,500 people who were wounded as a result of the explosion. It was later determined that the attack was driven by us. Osama bin Laden as part of the Al Qaeda network. And what he was doing was retaliation against the United States for their involvement and failure to assist with the war that Afghanistan had with the Russians, amongst other things. As a result, he decided to strike a caliphate against the United States. So in 1997, the U.S. became aware that there were bin Laden operatives who were active in East Africa, but they weren't able to neutralize that particular cell or cell groups before the actual attacks occurred on the embassies. They had knowledge of a plot to attack the U.S. embassy in Nairobi, but they failed to enhance any U.S. embassy measures. As a result, also, the U.S. ambassador who, at the time who was in charge of the embassy Prudence Bushnell asked the state to move the embassy because it was an exposed location in downtown Nairobi. But that request to move the embassy was later denied by State Department. If bin Laden wanted to attack Americans, why was he attacking Americans in East Africa? Was it a matter of just geographics, the location? It was because if he was coming after the U.S., the failed attempt in 1993 showed that there were security too hardened in the United States for potential attack at that time. So he felt that Africa was a new territory. August 7th served as an anniversary date of the U.S. troops actively being brought into Africa as part of the AFRICOM movement, Africa Command. So he picked that day as an anniversary to attack. He knew that most embassies in Africa were soft targets because they had never experienced the terrorist attack other than Beirut, of course, had their attack against the U.S. barracks, the Marine barracks. They had never really experienced anything of this magnitude before, so he knew there were soft target environments throughout the Africa and probably in other areas of the world as well. So he saw a real prime-rich environment there. They studied the geographics of the attack at both embassies. It took them almost two years to gather data to collect on how they were going to do the attack. They watched everything from how the guards changed positions to how they dealt with drive-up vehicles, everything they watched. Took pictures, photographs, and this is what led to them having intel that there was a potential attack against the embassy, but nobody took it seriously, kind of like 9-11. They knew that there were individuals out there who were training to fly planes, but they never imagined they were going to fly them in the U.S. targets. Well, tell me more about this the location of the Nairobi embassy. You said it was downtown. located downtown mm-hmm. Nairobi in basically the central business district. It uh, sat on a major corner adjacent to two major roadways, thoroughfares, kind of like if you were in New York going down West 57th or you were in Los Angeles going down one of the key roads and through downtown <clears throat> on both sides of the embassy were major corporation buildings. One was a bank. The other was, which was uh, the Ufundi Co-op House, I believe it was called. And then there was a bank called the Cooperative Bank on the other side. So when the explosion occurred, it was in such close proximity that it actually caused the collapse of one building completely. And it caused major damage to another building. Keep in mind also that glass was shattered because of the magnitude of the explosion. Glass was shattered for up to a half a mile away. What did they use? They got a Toyota truck, which is basically a refrigeration sized truck, and they hollowed it out, the walls of it. They put in 2,000 pounds worth of uh, TNT, ammonia nitrate, aluminum powder, and dead cord. They disguised the truck to look like a delivery truck. And the two terrorists who, who operated the vehicle had been shown that there was a dead man switch that ran from the actual detonation of the load through a line up to the front cab of the truck. And all he had to do was push a button, either one of the terrorists in the vehicle. Was this a suicide mission? It was set to be a suicide mission. Neither one of the two individuals were supposed to walk away from the explosion, but one did. 
to the credit of the security guard who was working for the embassy, there was a lift gate to the parking lot that led to the, the rear of the embassy where they made the approach. They challenged the security guard to lift the gate at gunpoint. They shot at him. He still refused. He ran from his post. The lift gate wasn't lifted. They threw a, a stun grenade at approaching other guards to force them back. And the terrorist who was in the passenger side got out of the vehicle to throw the grenade, but forgot his pistol inside of the vehicle. As a result, he fled from the vehicle. And we'll talk about that later. But the proximity of where the explosion occurred was so close that it literally moved the embassy on its foundation, didn't cause a collapse. But because it got as close to the building as it could, which was the gate, had it, would, had it been able to penetrate the gate and get inside of the courtyard to the embassy, it would have probably caused the embassy to collapse as well as the other building next to it, the Ufundi co-op house. Now, where were you at this time? You were, I, I take it, assigned as an agent in one of the field offices. So mm -hmm. where were you when you heard about this? We were actually assigned, I was assigned to the Washington field office. I was assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force National Capital Response Squad. And we were actively working domestic terrorism, actively working international terrorism that may have been inside of the U.S. borders. And we were working along with the other 56 field offices and state and local law enforcement and international law enforcement to make sure we stayed abreast of any possible attacks or any possible plots that they, were, they had going on. When the explosion occurred, it was it occurred there at 1030 in the morning. So it was it was six hours later or six hours earlier. If it was 1030 in the morning there, that meant it was uh, middle of the night in Washington. We got notified and they activated us the morning of the 7th. We traveled to the field office. We were told to start getting gear together for a rapid deployment team to deploy to Nairobi. We then had to go to State Department, get shots, get our shot card in order, pull all of our gear. And basically, we were told to pack for 10 days, which was going to be much longer than that, we would later find out. We then were taken to Andrews Air Force Base by 2 o'clock that afternoon, and we were told to just be ready to fly out. The military did not have an immediate transport plane to take us, but they did have one on the way. And by the time it arrived and we went airborne, it was well after midnight on the 8th that we traveled. Is this one of the first times that the FBI had deployed to a bombing event overseas? This was one of the first times we had applied, we had actually traveled to one of that magnitude. Since I was been in the Bureau, I'd also traveled to the bombing at the air base in Saudi Arabia, Kobar Towers. Um, that was another big deployment where we took multiple agents and equipment overseas via military aircraft, which would lead way then to other incidents occurring, the USS Cole, the attacks in India, several other incidents involving U.S. interests overseas that we were later deployed to travel to. But this was one of the primary, if not the primary time, we had this large of a footprint going out. And when you say large footprint, how many people actually deployed? We had 125 agents and, and technicians and roughly 40,000 pounds in equipment to travel. That's why they used the military, because they had a heavy load capacity. We were loaded onto a C-141, and we flew out on the morning of the 8th, midway after an, a refuel we developed mechanical problems. We had to land at Saganella, Sicily, at the air base there. The plane broke down. <laughs> we were there for 24 hours while they waited for another part to be flown in. And once the plane was refitted and re we reloaded up on the morning of the 9th, flew out and arrived into uh, Nairobi, Kenya in the middle of the night after midnight on the morning of the 10th. So you have all these people going. What exactly is the mission? The mission for us, number one, is to go over and investigate the actual bombing, to take into custody anybody who may have been responsible for it, to help with any other 
operations such as recovery and or basically protection of U.S. interests. The embassy had been hit, so there were a lot of documents. There were things like that that State Department could not have immediately stabilized because they had such a small mic force there. So we were brought in to help with that. We were more so for forensics and investigative capacity and, if necessary, to help with the local Kenyan CID and a police force to take anybody into custody that had caused this atrocity on Kenyan soil, but while attacking U.S. interests. We wanted to build a good footprint there and show that our cooperation with the Kenyans, as well as anybody else in any country, that if this ever happened again, we were prepared to not only respond, but to be an effective tool and to stopping future terrorist attacks overseas. In the past, we'd only focused on the United States and its territorial interests within the realm. But now we showed the capability to be able to branch out overseas and be an effective force working in conjunction with whatever government had requested us or whatever government we needed to work with in order to get the mission accomplished. Now, I had mentioned at the very top of the interview, the FBI's extraterritorial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Would you like to explain to people who haven't listened to those other episodes exactly what that entails, what that allows the FBI to do overseas? In the past, the FBI was looked upon to only be able to do investigations within the United States. They would rely on other agencies, national security agencies, to do any overseas investigations, OSS, CIA, et cetera, et cetera. But the FBI was pretty much known for a domestic national security agency. As time changed, as socioeconomic issues occurred throughout the world, There was a design and a desire that the FBI needed to be more capable to assist in overseas investigations, especially involving U.S. interests. We have an FBI agent assigned to every one of the embassies in the world for the very reason of being able to launch an investigation and, if necessary, to bring in additional assets to serve in that investigation. With this particular instance, Congress then changed the rules and basically said the FBI was not just a domestic national security investigative group, but they now had the power to be able to travel overseas, to go OCONUS, as the term is used, outside of the U.S. boundaries. But there were certain conditions that had to be met for that to happen. They had to have been requested by a foreign government, number one. And they had to also be able to show that their justification for traveling was to protect as well as investigate any attacks or any issues involving U.S. interests or holdings, i.e. embassies, i.e. foreign corporations, i.e. if a U.S. individual is kidnapped, for instance, overseas, we now have the power to travel overseas to help with the reallocation or the recapture of that individual from whatever enemy forces may have them. So what happened when you landed in Nairobi? We came in a little bit after midnight and we came, the color of night was the best thing for us because we didn't know if they had any other of the cell group watching to see when we were coming. So when we landed, they moved us to a stationary position on one of the auxiliary one runways so we could offload straight from the plane to waiting vehicles. When we landed, it was pretty much a silent mission. It was in the middle of the night. It was dark. The ironic thing about the Jobo Kenyatta airfield is it backs directly up to the Serengeti, which is the open wilderness. So in the distance, you could hear elephants, you could hear wildlife out in the woodlands, in the tree, you know, environment, in the bushes. And while we're unloading, one of the sentries for the Air Force tells everybody to stop. There was a pride of lions actually out there moving around that had picked up our scent and they were actually trying to figure out how they were coming in to see what we were doing. So everybody had to literally freeze. And they had night vision goggles and the snipers were watching these lions until they eventually moved away in a different direction. Once we were able to offload all of the equipment in the trucks, then we moved to a secondary point and then moved to one of the hotels to get everybody checked in. But the whole idea of it was to move with color of night so as not to draw too much attention to ourselves. Once morning arrived, we were at the secondary location. It was decided that we needed to split our our footprint, to split our our task force. 
uh, 125 agents roughly on board and technicians, it was decided that 75 agents and techs would approach the Nairobi crime scene and deal with that. And then the remaining force being 50 or 55 individuals would get back on a secondary aircraft and fly to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania to address that issue. It was a a smaller crime scene. So they wanted to make sure they kept the majority of the larger force to deal with uh, the crime scene in Nairobi, Kenya. Once that occurred, basically they sent the Philadelphia and Chicago field office agents to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. They kept the WFO in New York field office agents and technicians to go to Nairobi, Kenya. Now you're coming into Nairobi. There's a crisis going on. I'm sure the city itself is just in crisis mode. Where right. do they put you up? I mean, how, how do you get established as this huge investigative force coming into this country in the midst of a crisis? Well, ironically, the State Department knew we were coming, so they had to set for lodging. Fortunately, they did not have enough State Department facilities to house the entire group. So it was decided we would take over a commercial hotel in the downtown area near the crime scene. So with that first night, we were brought to the Sheraton Hotel in downtown. But they looked at the design of it, which looked like a stack of pancakes, basically. It was one of the old cylinder-shaped Sheraton hotels. Somebody said, you can drive a car bomb right in here, and it will collapse the entire structure within seconds. So once again, in the middle of the night, we were pulled back out and we went to a secondary hotel, which was a little bit easier to defend because with the sentiment of what had happened, Muslims were in an outrage because of the attacks. The general Kenyan citizenship was in an outrage. They knew the U.S. forces were coming. They didn't want to get the impression that we were coming to take over. We were coming there as a partnership. So we actually had to find a place that could be easily defendable if uh, a mob or if a terrorist group wanted to try to attack us while we set up command structure as well as a base of operations. It sounds like from the casualties there that the majority of the people who were killed were from Nairobi, Kenyans. Uh, That was correct. 224 people were killed in Nairobi. Ironically, the largest capacity of people who were killed were the individuals who were attending a school at the Ufundi co-op house. The average Kenyan has at least a bachelor's degree, if not a master's degree, and they work from everything from a maid to a cab driver. But this particular school that was adjacent to the embassy was a secretarial school. So they had a large amount of people who were attending classes there, kind of like a, a community college. So you had males and females that were attending there as students, you had staff, you had faculty. And when the explosion occurred just adjacent to the embassy, it basically pancaked and leveled that building where it collapsed within itself. If the truck had been able to get through the gate and closer to the embassy, would those casualties, would they have still been killed? Based upon what they saw from the design of the weapon, Had they been able to drive it into the garage area of the embassy, and that was the plan, to drive it through the gate, into the courtyard, and into the interior garage, and detonate it right inside of the garage. Had they been able to do that, the majority of the embassy would have absorbed a large amount of the explosion and would have probably spared the surrounding buildings, at least from collapse, if not from structural damage. But because it was in the middle of a courtyard with two buildings on either side and the rear of the embassy facing the truck, the blast went up and out, which shattered everything and collapsed the buildings closest to it. Now, were the Kenyans, were they angry at the United States because of the the deaths that occurred, which were, of course, intended for U.S. citizens? Or were they understanding that this was a terrorist attack and that the real enemy were the Al-Qaeda members? Mm -hmm. I think it was kind of a mixture. You had those that were angry because they felt that was collateral damage, that they were caught and they lost family members. They had caused collapses of businesses and structural designs. They were angry about loss of economic income, just the overall shock of it all. Those that were not necessarily angry with the U.S. were angry with 
anybody who was of a Muslim faith or could have been associated with Al-Qaeda. So it was kind of a dual direction that the anger was going in because we came in and initially tried to work with salvage operations to help rescue people and to show that we were not just there to investigate, that we were there also to help. I think that curtailed a lot of the animosity that would have formed had we come straight in and just basically went into our embassy and just dealt with just our embassy alone. But we constantly did a PR job letting the people of Kenya know we were there not only because our embassy was attacked, but we were there also to help capture the people who had hurt their citizens of the Kenyan government. And I think that did a lot to thwart and quash a lot of the anger that they were they were feeling initially. And in the, in the long run, they ended up helping. They became very helpful with us because one of the key things that I credit the Kenyan government with doing was as soon as the explosion occurred and they realized that they had had an issue with terrorists in their city of Nairobi, they shut down every avenue of escape. They blocked all the highways. They shut down the airport. They shut down the train stations. They shut down any possibility of being able to leave the city of Nairobi to escape once the explosion was done. And they did that in a matter of hours. So that basically locked a number of the the terrorists into the city where they couldn't escape. And that was how we were later able to capture two of the terrorists within the first 96 to 120 hours of being on the ground because they couldn't go anywhere. One of the key arrests that we made was of Mohammed Rash Dawit Al-Alawi, who was captured at the Hilltop Hotel. He was the passenger inside of the bomb truck who had fled from the explosion. You don't understand how a caliphate works or a martyr for the uh, caliphate. He has to die or she has to die in battle. That's either firing a pistol, throwing a grenade, or basically doing some type of force to destroy the enemy. They don't have any of that in place and they die as a result of that attack, And but they're not fighting when they die. They're refused to allow to go to Mecca. And as a result, this individual, Mr. Al-Alawi, had forgotten to bring his pistol out of the truck to fight with. So all he had was the stun grenade in his hand. When he threw the stun grenade, and it blew up, he had no other weapons to fight with. So he realized, if I die now, I may not get to go to heaven or to Mecca. So he fled the scene, basically to get away with the motto of live to fight another day. When he was running up the street from the explosion, the driver, Azam, detonated the truck bomb and the shrapnel from the explosion caught him in the back. So he was peppered literally in the back with multiple injuries. When we went to the hilltop after following investigative leads that led us to the hilltop hotel, we made entry into his room or to the room where we were told the terrorists were and where they had built components for the bomb. He was sitting on the bed when we made entry. He stood up as if to fight. And then he sat back down on the bed and basically said, I've been sitting here waiting for you all because I knew you were coming because he had nowhere to escape to. That's how we took one of the two terrorist in the custody within the first 96 to 120 hours of being on the ground. That's what you call good work. (laughs) That's good cooperation, especially with the Kenyan government. We could talk about that for a little bit because I'd like to establish what the relationship was with Kenyan security and and law enforcement officials, because we've talked on the podcast about the National Academy. Did we have people already there within law enforcement and security in in Kenya that knew us, that knew the FBI and, you know, trusted and supported the FBI coming into the country? Yes and no. We had individuals within the embassy who touted the FBI's abilities. We have a reputation for being known as the world police in the sense of we are requested to help with investigations, whether small or large, anywhere in the world. There was no previous FBI presence in Nairobi in the sense of having a training academy or any type of field training that had been conducted for them. So when the request was made from the Kenyan government for assistance, State Department immediately was responsible for helping get us launched initially in. The only pushback came where 
state didn't want us to bring any weapons. They wanted us to come in basically naked and do our investigative work with the Kenyan police. We would be assigned to work with the Kenyan police, one agent, one officer or detective. And if anything happened, we were supposed to rely on that officer for security. Well, of course, our director said, absolutely not. We come in, we come in with at least sidearms, pistols. So it was decided that we wouldn't bring any long guns in. And the Kenyan government seemed to be happy with that. So we were able to bring weapons in. We had to get a special visa clearance to carry those weapons. We also had to be debriefed and told if you're out doing an investigation, you happen to have to engage someone and shoot them or kill them. Your first mission is to get back to the command post because we're going to have to get you out of the country immediately. Because if we shot or killed anybody over there, whether it was justified or not, they were more worried that the Kenyans would rally forth and want to have somebody expatriated and killed as a result. And there were incidents that occurred while we were there. Two of our agents went with the Kenyan officer to one of the motor dealerships to track down the leads as to where the trucks had been purchased from to use to make the bombs to drive to the embassies. And while they were there, gunmen came in and tried to rob the dealership at gunpoint. And our agents, along with the police, had to help in a shootout with the robbers. And Talk about they, bad timing. I don't think they expected that kind of firepower. I think one was killed and the other was wounded. But luckily, the Kenyan police took credit for the entire incident. We suffered a minor hiccup, but it wasn't anything enough to shut us down. We continued to move out throughout the country to Mombasa and other places. We took our firearms with us. And we had to move it with the diplomatic pouches so as no one would have actual access to the weapons themselves. When we traveled on commercial air or anywhere, we had to check them into a diplomatic pouch. We couldn't carry them directly on the plane as we would in an American airline type situation. The Kenyans were blessed to have us. They really were. And we were assigned to work directly with them. That way, we knew what they were doing all the time. They knew what we were doing all the time. So what was your assignment? What were you assigned to do? I was initially assigned as an investigator when I arrived. I had had some tactical background training. So we were working aggressive leads. As time went on, I was assisting, working with a CID detective. Her name was Susan and Jerry. She and I went out every day and we were given a list of leads to cover, people to talk to, and we would travel through the city to talk to different individuals who might give us leads to where we needed to go next. And as time went on, I was able to develop a couple of good sources within the Kenyan government, where if we needed any further information on individuals, they were quietly requested to help us. They would come back and provide us with whatever information we needed to move the investigation forward. And it was really a great co-op, but because we never gave up who those individuals were within the Kenyan government, And in the same right, they felt it was their patriotic duty to help us to bring these people to justice who had caused this tremendous atrocity. In addition to the passenger in the truck who escaped and you were able to get them within three or four days, who else were you looking for? We were looking for anyone and everyone tied in to this attack. That was everyone from Mr. Bin Laden himself, another individual, Saif Al-Adel, Ayman Al-Zawahiri who was later killed years later, Abdullah Ahmed Abdullah. And specifically, (laughs) we really drove a hard search for Fazul Abdullah Mohammed, who was one of the ground persons there in Africa who helped to drive the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. We searched for him in Mombasa. We looked for him in Kampala, Uganda, where we actually traveled. We went to Algeria even looking for him, and then even to the Comoros Islands looking for this individual. And he was killed in June of of 2011, on June 8th, while in Mogadishu, Somalia, fighting with the terrorist group there against U.S. and Somali forces. He was killed in a shootout. So the majority of the individuals who had helped build this plot are either in current in custody or they're currently dead. So there's really not anyone else that we're searching hardcore for, especially with the fall of bin Laden several years ago. But of course, other groups and individuals have taken their place. Splinter groups have popped up. In Nigeria, you've got Boko Haram. 
You're seeing a resurgence of other major terrorist groups, the black flag groups who are now trying to resurge and rebuild the whole Al-Qaeda network. And it is only through the cooperation of our U.S. government with other countries that we can serve to tear down these walls and take these individuals offline again. And it's a continual daily process. It's nothing that we can sit back on our laurels and just relax. We have to continuously drive to keep the world free for democracy. As far as this Kenya police CID officer that you were working with, you had mm-hmm. talked about developing some sources. Did your sources you know, provide you with any type of information that was crucial or was yes. you know, very helpful in this investigation? Not only crucial, but paramount, because their immediate uh, attention to the request we were looking for, trying to find information out about particular addresses, phone numbers, et cetera, their direct attention to that and getting us immediate results back helped us to follow a trail that was growing cold and helped to rewarm the trail that we were able to track down every location they had used in and around Kenya, whether in Runda Estates or whether in the outskirts of town at a pizza parlor that they had abandoned and used to reform and outfit the trucks with the devices, even to go down to Mombasa, Kenya, and to other countries throughout Africa to help us with our trail to Uganda, to Algeria. These are all places that we were able to follow leads to, to later pull people in who were responsible or played very small roles but yet active roles in the attack. You got to tell us, how were you able to do that? How did you, what did you use to gather that information? Well, like in most cases, you have to have surreptitious meetings with them and you have to basically work very closely with them. There has to be a level of trust that's developed. Discreteness has to be maintained and you can never lend to who these people are under any investigative issues. Even if we were called to testify on the stand, we would have to plead the fifth as to who the individual or individuals were that gave us this information. The government later was able to reward them for their assistance from the U.S. government because it was highly appreciated and praised and they received accreditation for it. That's pretty much as close as I want to go with it without possibly still managing to get anybody in trouble who may still work with the Kenyan government now. Understood. No problem. Through the information that we were able to extract from our sources, we were able to actually build a huge matrix that showed where they met to build the devices, where they met to discuss their attack plans, and this being the terrorist groups. It was able to show that there were actually one or more cell groups operating within the Nairobi area, but they were all interconnected. One area was used strictly for meetings and or storage. One area was used to build the timing components or the triggering the components. One area was used to refabricate the trucks. All of these different locations were in and around Nairobi and even in Mombasa, where the trucks were purchased from a used car dealership and driven or shipped to Nairobi themselves. All of these different locations, we went out and investigated and we actually went with their Kenyan SWAT team to go and they would do the initial entry. We would come in, do the test for any type of explosive residue, look for any components, look for any information that might lead us to the next level of who the person or persons may be that were associated with that location. We were able to get rental agreements for homes that they rented. We were able to look at leases for properties that they had secured. We even were able to get titles and deeds for the vehicles that they had purchased. And all of this helped to build a quantum case against this organization to tear it down eventually in court. You had said that you were initially told that you would be away for about 10 days. How long did all of this take? How long were you there? I was shipped over for four rotations. Each rotation roughly was about 40 days that we were there. The first team that I went in, the the initial ground force, we were there for 40 to 42 days, and then they rotated them out. As soon as I got back to the United States with the first group, I was immediately told, you're going to have to go back because your sources don't want to talk to anybody else. They don't want to trust anybody else. They only want to talk to you. So you're going to have to go back and meet with them and continue with the investigation. So I ended up having to rotate three more times back over to Kenya, and I served roughly over 150 days in Kenya, 
on the investigation, give or take. And I actually came back speaking a lot of Swahili that I had not been aware that I had picked up. I'd been over there for so long. Well, I think that for some people, they'll be very interested in what was going on with your home life. If you don't mind sharing that with us. I mean, you're gone for so long. Were you married at the time? Do you have children? At the time I was married, I had not had any kids yet with my, with my wife. We'd gotten married in 97. And in 98 was when this incident occurred. So they had to understand, hey, look, I'm going to be gone. This is not a joy ride that I'm going on. This is not any type of bachelor vacation. I'm literally over there wearing Kevlar body armor every day, going out investigating people, talking to people, working with the local police and the international police to try to bring these people to justice. It was just, it was a strain, but overall they understood in the long run. Anything that happened with the marriage happened long after the investigation was over as far as the marriage ending. I'm sure that these type of events can be pretty hard on a relationship. Just like the military. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard state of mind, but... I am a military brat. I understand that the sacrifices. Yeah. Believe it or not, the FBI is a, considered a paramilitary organization in some instances, especially when we're dealing with overseas deployments. If you get assigned to an ALAD, if you get assigned to a LEGAT, you may be gone 120 days at a time and then come home every six months to visit family, to see your kids or whatever. So it does put a strain on a relationship. But if the, the couple understand each other and they know that this is for the good of the country, then it's plausible, it's acceptable in the long run. Could you bring us up to date on what happened with those deployed to Tanzania? We traveled over at least on two occasions just to be of assistance and to follow leads that took us to Tanzania. They were having the same effective results with tracking down the individuals. They actually wrapped up their investigation a lot quicker than the Kenyan investigation, again, because it was a smaller site. There were fewer players that had actively been involved there on the ground. And the individuals who were responsible for the destruction there actually had died with their vehicle. And they were able to actually close out that portion of the investigation and tie it into the Nairobi investigation a lot quicker than we could because we had so many more leads to follow in our portion of the investigation. I know they stayed on the game 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They were there roughly the same amount of time. They may have ended their investigation within the first six months. We carried that investigation in Nairobi on for almost two years. I remember, of course, I was in the Bureau at the mm. time. I wasn't working these type of investigations. But since I was in Philadelphia, I was aware of, you know, agents from our office participating mm -hmm. in these type of overseas events. It just sounds like it was a very volatile time mm -hmm. for the country, for the world. There were other things that were happening overseas that the FBI became involved in. Yes, ma'am. There were other incidents that were going on, but specifically the one that really made us open our eyes was when President Clinton launched a strike against Al-Qaeda forces by launching 12 cruise missiles. He had them strike a pharmaceutical research facility who supposedly bin Laden was having chemicals built into weapons for later use. And then he also struck a couple of the Al-Qaeda strong cells in one of the other areas. We were not informed of this attack coming, especially the attacks that went into Afghanistan against the bin Laden camps. And as a result, here we are, a 75 to 125 man force or person force caught out in the wind with no backup. Clinton did not let the director of the FBI at the time, who was Louis Free, know that he was doing this. And once he launched the strike and the director found out, he immediately demanded a meeting with Clinton. We were out there literally on the broken end of a bottle. And we had to immediately set up lookout stations. We had to put investigative agents on surveillance, counter surveillance. I mean, not that that wasn't going on before, but it was heightened now as a result because it furthered to put a gap or distance between Muslim tradition and faith and what the U.S. interest was trying to accomplish. That had to be a very tense situation. We went 
from Tarkan Alpha to Delta, literally within a matter of 15 minutes, from sitting at dinner watching the television and them launching these missiles to ramping everybody up to go to high alert and get ready for a possible attack coming against us at either at the hotel or out at the uh, crime scene. And luckily, by then, we were rotating regular SWAT teams in from the field offices, Miami, Atlanta, Dallas, all were all sending their enhanced SWAT teams down to serve as overwatch for those working at the crime scene every day. So at least we had a protective force there along with the military and with the Kenyans who would be able to keep an eye and watch our backs while we were there working in the crime scene area. At the beginning of uh, our discussion, you talked about there being several areas of your mission. And it sounds like the investigative part was very, very successful. When it mm -hmm. came to the mitigation of future terrorist threats in the, in the region, did you have any successes in that area? Well, because of our relationships being built so well with the Kenyan police, a couple of years later, we actually went in and set up a training academy through the FBI where we would actually send them to kind of a national academy that most would travel to the United States for from international police forces. We actually set up a FBI academy slash field office in Nairobi, which served to train officers to be better suited for dealing with terrorism and counterterrorism issues, and also train them to be more enhanced as police officers within their own regime. That sounds like success also. All right. Anything else that uh, you wanted to mention? I think we pretty much have hit all of the key points that we can go into with a time frame. You probably could sit here and talk for 10 or 12 hours about every exact instance that happened, the close calls and how we missed terrorists by literally minutes arriving at the location where they were coming there as we were going in the front door, they were sneaking out the back door and escaping. It got to be quite a game of chess at some point where, you know, unless you were a true brinksman, you were going to miss getting your queen checkmated. So did you have any close calls? You know, things that now looking back on it, you're thinking to yourself, my God, you know, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I barely made it out. Give us one or two of those. One instance was when we went into a certain area of Nairobi that was heavily heavily uh, fortified. Actually, it was in Mombasa, forgive me. We were looking for Haroon Fazul, and he supposedly was living with someone in an area of the city that was frequented and had a large community of Muslims. We arrived with the Kenyan investigative group, the CID officers down in Mombasa to that location. When we went into that residence to look for him, to arrest him, and to search that residence, there may have been three or four people on the street. But we pull up in four cars in a van, spread out, surround the building, go in, deal with everybody inside the building, find out he's not there, then proceed to search for two hours. And then you come outside, and there are four or five hundred. Muslim people gathered who were screaming and yelling about, we shouldn't be there. We shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. This is, and you watch as two or three of the Kenyan detectives go to the crowd and make some type of hand gesture and sound with their mouth. And you see people just kind of just start turning around and walking away. I don't see that kind of cooperation here in the United States if you get a mob mentality. I see us getting our butts kicked out there. If you've got a three or 400 people force and you've got 12 agents there, I see it getting to be a very ugly day where you may have to go to lethal action. But the Kenyan police were able to deal with the crowd and quell them with just some hand gestures and some sounds they made with their mouths. And literally people turned around and walked away. And that's a respect or a fear of Kenya law enforcement? It's kind of a combination because there's a reputation with the Kenyan police and with all due respect to them, the CID or Criminal Investigative Division, they have been known to come to someone's house, pick them up in the middle of the night, and the family may never see them again or hear from them ever again. That's deep. Yeah. 
Well, I want to thank you so much. I mean, this has been fascinating to get this behind the scenes, detailed look at what it's like to be deployed as an FBI agent overseas. And I can't think of anything, and you can help me with this, anything more recently where the FBI has been deployed in a terrorist type crisis event overseas. Has there been any recently or am I blinking? Within the last five years, I, my mind comes short of anything. I think the most recent ones that we would have deployed to overseas was when you had the attack at the shopping mall in Westfall in, in Nairobi. That was back, I think, in the early 2000s or the mid 2000s. Then you had the attack in India. Mumbai, where we sent FBI forces over to assist the Indian National Police. Other than responding to national security special events or world events like the Olympics and things down in Argentina, we really, I don't think, have had a major footprint move such as that in probably five or seven years. Well, I certainly am not complaining. We have enough right now to worry about yes, here at home, so, yes, so that's good. Well, we're at the point of the interview where I ask when you Mm -hmm. joined the FBI and why you joined the FBI. So what's your story, Jock Baptiste? I joined the the FBI in July of 1995. I was the only African-American in my class, former lawyer. I had worked in law enforcement as a reserve officer with one of the police agencies in New Orleans after law school and then starting down the road of law practice, I realized I want to do something more than just bang the books. I want to be able to help make a difference in society. So I joined the FBI and basically became an agent to try to champion for the justices of people who could not get anybody to fight for them, to help with investigations, to try to make a difference in the world and make the world more peaceful and make a world better for my son to grow up in and my family to be able to live in. Well, those are definitely admirable goals. In addition to being on the Joint Terrorism Task Force in the Washington Field Office, WFO, you were promoted up the ladder and had some other interesting assignments. Uh, Yes, ma'am. I was a supervisory special agent within five years of being in the Bureau. Worked in hazardous devices response unit as a bomb tech and trained up to the level of mitigation of weapons of mass destruction, work tactical, work safe streets, work drugs, work the gangs, pretty much did a little bit of everything. Tried to get my feet wet on every area possible. Worked in cyber for a minute to learn how the latest cyber technology and crimes were being committed. And then the most profitable time was spent both working with the youth in the out- outreach program But more importantly, working with the Office of Partnership Engagement, where we built better relationships between the FBI and federal, state, and international law enforcement agencies to have better relationships with them. And we weren't just that big brother coming in at the last minute to take over your operation. We're actually here to help your operation with whatever you need us to do. When I was with the Office of Partnership Engagement, we often would do advances for the director who would be invited to several law enforcement meetings as being a bomb tech also. So even though I was not immediately assigned to the actual director's task force, I would be called upon to work with the advance team. When they would hit the ground and see me there, they already knew several things had been put into place to help with the movement of the director or the attorney general, because I had boots on the ground ahead of them. Just like we always know, working in law enforcement, plans don't always work out. With only a few more minutes to go of the interview, you were called away to duty and you are now back recording the last part of the interview with me and you're sitting in a police car. So (laughs) how appropriate. When did you retire? I retired in August of 2017. And what are you doing now? I work now as the training and tactical coordinator for the Orleans Constable's Office in New Orleans, trying to teach and bring young law enforcement minds to understand that there's more to life than being a warrior. You have to be more so a guardian now. Could you explain that? The concept of law enforcement has always taken on a reference of warrior, meaning 
to go in, take no casualties. You bring out whoever at whatever cost. You punish whoever you need to to get the ends met. We are public servants. We serve the people. We should still maintain a level of authority because we are that fine line between chaos and order. But in the same breath, we have to be a little bit more compassionate, especially now with what everyone's going through with this COVID environment, with the recent change in government, with the fervor of hate and discrimination that's been resurged in this country. We have to understand more so what people's thoughts, their minds, their, their processes are. We have to be a little bit more compassionate and we have to really learn to accept the word servility and understand that sometimes we have to go beyond what the job calls for in order to serve the public. The next thing I was going to say to you was that I like to give my guests the last word. You just said a powerful statement there. Is there anything else? For those of us who choose to walk that path in law enforcement, it's a very challenging time now. So keep your head held high. It's an honorable profession. In the Bible, it is written, there's no greater love than to serve your fellow man. And law enforcement is still one of the ways to do that. Unfortunately, some of the officers that we hire now last picked for kickball growing up. So they feel a badge and a gun gives them the authority over people to do exactly what they want, when they want, and how they want it. But they need to understand everything comes limits and boundaries. And for a single officer to unethically act and do something that's not precedented by law, by the Constitution, or by his training or her training, he embarrasses the profession. He makes it twice as hard for those of us who are trying to build a profession honorably to maintain. So for anyone who wants to venture into law enforcement, whether it's at local level, state level, international, or even military or federal level, look in the mirror. Ask yourself, number one, why you're doing it. Number two, ask yourself how long you want to do it. And then number three, understand it's a thankless job a lot of the time. So the rewards you walk away with was knowing that you came home safely to your family every day, but you were able to act and do your job to the best of your ability every day. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a couple of photos of Jock Baptiste, lots of articles, photos, and a video of the aftermath of the 1998 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, and a dedication to Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alphen. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my reader team. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. You can join my reader team on my website or use the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, Fun for Armchair Detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, 
please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.